Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Connor. Thank you, everybody, for coming on such a, a miserable, miserable cold evening. It's really, but we can all huddle together for warmth like penguins and we'll be fine. Um, I am uh, I'm Tim Harford, as you heard. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Adam Grant. And what, what can I say about Adam? I mean, he's one of the, uh, the most uh, exciting and most readable thinkers in the world today. Um, he's also a man who once had hidden potential. Uh, he <laughs> was a competitive diver who was afraid of heights. When he was admitted to university, he was asked to take a writing test, and his writing was so disastrous, he was told that he needed remedial lessons to, Im to improve it. Uh, now, of course, he's uh, an enormous success, a, a professor at Wharton, uh, the author of multiple best-selling books, uh, including Think Again, which is a, a book I really love, including Hidden Potential, the book we'll be discussing uh, tonight. Uh, presenter of various podcasts, Work Life uh, from TED, New York Times, uh, op-ed writer. I could go on and on and Please on. Please don't. And, but yeah, we should, we should probably talk to, uh, to Adam about his book. I should also say, um, I feel like we're friends, um, even though this is actually, the first time we met each other was an hour ago. Uh, and... I think that says something about Adam's charm and his generosity. I feel we're in incredibly safe hands tonight. So we should, we should begin by, by talking about uh, Hidden Potential. It's a, I read this book over Christmas. I loved it. Um, it's just full of notes and scribbles. Uh, so many fascinating ideas um, about hidden potential, uh, about who can be successful and how to become more successful, um, and how to, not just to become more successful, but how to achieve more um, in life. It even made me cry. Uh, I am an economist with a heart made of dollar bills, so it's not, <laughs> it's not easy to make me cry. So um, we, we should talk, Adam, and, and I'm gonna, hopefully we're gonna go all over the shop tonight, but I'm gonna start with a fairly basic question, which is, you open the book, with a story about uh, a school who they get into chess and competitive chess. Why did you start with this story and what does it teach us about the, the, thing, the messages you're trying to get across in the book? Well, I, I do want to weigh in on that, but first I have to say that was the most positive introduction I've ever heard from a British person. <laughs> I'm like, what, what country is this? Where are we? <laughs> I, I used to live in Sheffield and no one ever talked that way. So. <laughs> You used to live in Sheffield? Yes. I did not, so so I, I grew up in Chesterfield, which is about 10 miles south, as you were. So what were you doing in Sheffield? Sorry, excuse us. <laughs> what were you doing in Sheffield? Uh, apparently watching a lot of snooker was, was the takeaway, but yeah, uh, I did a sabbatical at the Institute of Work Psychology. So my wife and I moved here, it was about uh, 17 years ago, right. and had a blast. Excellent, and did you spend time at the Crucible watching the snooker, or any, indeed anything else? Mostly, mostly on TV at night, but uh, we spent a lot of time in the Peak District and the Lake District. So. Um, Thank you for uh, adding a little bit of upbeat enthusiasm uh, um, yeah, it's, it's to those really, memories. It's how, we, yeah, it's how we do things up north. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, where were we? Chess. <laughs> yeah, yeah let, let's talk about chess. So I, I actually you know, I, I backed into chess. Uh, I didn't set out to write about it in the book. Um, I like chess. It's a fun game to play. I'm not particularly good at it. But I was, um, I was reading some research, and I, when I read a book, um, I think as you do, I always start with the, the evidence, and then say I need to find a story and play journalist uh, that will bring the evidence to life. Yeah. And so the evidence that I was trying to capture uh, showed that if you had an experienced kindergarten teacher, uh, you ended up being more likely to graduate from college, and also you earned more money in your career. It's like, wow, kindergarten teachers matter that much? Like the person who taught you when, when you were five years old, if you were lucky to have somebody who had 20 years of experience, uh, that set you up for success. And I, I just couldn't believe that at first. And then after I looked through the, the evidence from economists, it was very rigorous and very compelling. And the mechanism stunned me. I thought that the, the experienced kindergarten teachers were great at teaching math and reading, and they'd give you a cognitive edge. But as you know, that's not what the data showed. What really mattered was they taught you character skills. They taught discipline, they taught determination, they taught you to be proactive in seeking new knowledge and pro-social in sharing your knowledge. And I wanted to write about the importance of character skills and driving growth. And I was looking for a story, and I spent a good three months spinning my wheels, um, uh, trying to find, is there one magical kindergarten teacher who has 
three students over the course of decades who have gone on to achieve extraordinary things, and I couldn't find one. And then eventually I gave up, and I said, what's the closest thing to a kindergarten teacher? A coach. And so I started searching for coaches of teams that had unlikely success. And I, I stumbled, it was literally a Google search, into a story about the Raging Rooks, and I was so moved by them and their coach, I said, this, this actually could be the whole book, but at minimum, it's gotta be the intro. Yeah, and the Raging Rooks, this is a team of kids who often never played chess before, uh, they go to a rough school, they come from a rough area, they have a lot of disadvantages, and you know, we don't wanna spoil the story completely, but they, ended up, they end up in very, very competitive chess environments, playing chess against kids who have every advantage and every privilege, and, and frankly, who are better chess players than them. And, and how do they deal with that and, and rise to that challenge? And it's all about character. Not, it's not just about how good you are at playing chess, it turns out. Surprisingly, so the, their coach, Maurice, uh, Maurice Ashley, he had uh, immigrated to New York from Jamaica, and he wanted to create opportunity for kids who had been denied it. And he said, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna teach you that mastering the game of, of chess is all about honing your character skills. So we're gonna teach you to have the discipline to not take the first good move that you see, but actually do the analysis and look for a better one. We're gonna teach you to be proactive in anticipating your opponent's moves and trying to see the end game from the beginning. We're also gonna teach you to be pro-social in reviewing every game you play with your teammates and coaching each other on how you could have made better choices. And guess what, when you get into a high pressure moment in the national championships, um, no matter how good you are at chess, if you don't have those character skills, you fall apart. Um, you don't have the discipline to pause and have patience under pressure when the clock is ticking. Um, you haven't necessarily thought far enough ahead when you've made a move and somebody is about to checkmate you and you feel like you just have to dodge and you miss the opportunity to go on offense. So um, I think that, that Maurice was an incredible teacher of character skills and for me, it was a powerful story because he demonstrated that if you can get good at teaching and learning the skills of character at any stage of life, uh, you can actually achieve more than you thought was possible and more than other people expected of you. And these are the, the so-called soft skills, which I, mean, I, I, I was blown away when you revealed what the origin of the, of the phrase soft skills was. Does anybody know where soft skills come from as a term? And if you've read the book, you can't. <laughs> no, that, that doesn't count, but thank you for reading. No. Uh, so I, I, I was really disappointed to learn this. So the origin of the term soft skills is the US Army, back in the 1960s, was trying to classify a set of skills that they didn't know how to describe, uh, and they called them soft skills. They were basically leadership skills, collaboration skills, um, character skills, uh, resilience. Um, they called them soft because they didn't involve working with tanks or guns. So there was no metal, the hard skills were the literal weapon skills, and then all the important stuff that they thought really drove growth and team success, those were soft skills, and they basically ruined our ability to take soft skills seriously for the next half century. Yeah. Thank you, US Army. <laughs> so, I, I mean, the book is, a, is in large part about soft skills and the, the building of these soft skills, the building of these character skills, how to cultivate them in ourselves, how to cultivate them in, in other people, one of the things that I think is unusual, very unusual about the book, I mean, there are, we're, we're, we're blessed. It's a golden age of kind of thoughtful books full of great stories and interesting research. One of the things that is different about this one is it's so full of practical ideas. So, for example, the, you talk about prosociality. You have this example in the book of how you with your own students, uh, you were giving them these tough tests and these multiple choice tests, and, and you said, oh, um, I will give you in some circumstances, you're allowed to basically say, hey, instead of using my answer, I'm gonna nominate someone else in the class, and, uh, and whatever they say, you could give me that, the, the grade for that answer. And that, I think, unlocked something very interesting, and, and I don't think it was, you weren't intending to do it, right? You, it was an accident. Complete accident. 
So I went into class one day, I had a group of undergrads, mostly 20 and 21 years old, and I told them that the final exam was gonna be extremely challenging because I think what I teach matters. I think understanding human psychology is relevant to your success and your happiness and your relationships with other people, and I want you to know this material cold. So I'm gonna give you not just multiple choice questions, I'm gonna give you multiple, multiple, multiple choice where uh, we've got five answer options, and you also have, it could be A and B, or A and C, or A and D, or A, B and C, or A and D. And they looked at the sample questions and freaked out. And they said, we're, we're just, even if we know the material, we're never gonna, we're never gonna figure this out. And I didn't, wanna, I didn't wanna reduce the challenge level, uh, but I did want to reduce their anxiety. So I said, all right, I'm gonna let you pick the hardest question and write down the name of a classmate who you think will know the answer. And if they get it right, you get the points too. And all of a sudden, they were like, great, yes, we're all gonna memorize the name of the smartest kid in the class. <laughs> we're, we're all gonna then write it down, and then, then we're good. And I gave out the final exam, and the class average went up by, I think it was 3%, uh, with an identical degree of difficulty from the previous year's exam. And then it happened again the next year. And I thought, I was like, oh, they're just getting the extra points because they wrote down the name of someone who knew the answer that they didn't. But actually, the gain had nothing to do with that. What happened was, and a group of students explained it to me, was once they needed to know who was the expert, they had to study together instead of alone. And so they started organizing group study sessions and class study sessions. And then each student became an expert on a different segment of the material. And then their job was to summarize it and teach it to the rest of the class. And lo and behold, the students who did the teaching were actually the ones who learned the most. Yeah. I mean, that's how, I forget, there's the coach effect, there's the te there's This is the tutor the effect. Tut the tutor effect. Yeah. So talk us through this, because I found this very interesting. Okay, so the, the original finding here, um, can I just get a show of hands? How many of you are first born in your family? Oldest child, or, um, or only child? Okay, technically only child, you get to pick your order. You could be first or last. <laughs> um, okay, and how many of you are later born, so you have an older sibling? Okay, let me apologize in advance. I don't want to offend any of you. But there, there is an empirically robust finding in psychology that firstborns score slightly higher on IQ tests than laterborns. I knew it. <laughs> As a firstborn, I was delighted by this evidence. My sister was really pissed. <laughs> so the question is why? And you all know in birth order, it can't be genetics, right? There has to be a nurture component, not a nature component, um, or maybe something in between, which we probably won't talk about today. But one of the findings is that uh, actually the more younger siblings you have as a firstborn, uh, the more of an IQ boost you get. And it's a very small effect, by the way. But it comes from the fact that the older kid has to teach the younger siblings. And the more time you spend teaching your young, younger siblings, the more you have to retrieve information in your head, which means you remember it better. And the more you have to explain it, which means you understand it better. And so I think this is what was happening with my students is they were teaching this material over and over again and eventually as they talked it through, it clicked and it stuck. And by the way, later borns, you just need to teach other kids and you're good. Three younger sisters, uh, two younger step siblings, just saying. Um, <laughs> so, so, where is your British humility now? <laughs> I mean, like, Scott, I'm not, I'm not taking credit for it. I'm just saying, like, now, now I understand that my brilliance is nothing to do with me. It's, ah, it's you're trying to give credit to your younger exactly. sisters for giving you the privilege of teaching. I understand exactly. now. Yeah, they're cr credit for something anyway, for sure. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, I mentioned that the, the book has all these uh, various practical ideas. Um, one of the things that really grabbed me was, was your description of your process for getting feedback, or actually you said, don't ask for feedback, so let's not say feedback, getting information from other people that will help you perform better. So what, what is your basic approach to, to getting useful advice, useful feedback from others? Talk us through it. Do you want the quick, uh, the quick tip, or do you want the story that leads into the tip? What do you reckon, go? Yeah? All right, we're gonna do the quick tip. <laughs> Uh, no, okay, so the, the story, the, I guess what, what really taught me this lesson was uh, I was 25 years old, uh, I just finished my doctorate, and I got an invitation to teach uh, Air Force generals and colonels in the US. Uh, I was supposed to teach a four-hour class on motivation and leadership. And I was supposed to do it twice, uh, two different groups, uh, one week and then another group the next week. 
I felt completely underqualified. I felt like a huge imposter. Um, these, uh, these colonels and generals, they had multi-billion pound budgets. They had uh, thousands of flying hours under their belt. They had cool nicknames like out of Top Gun. Uh, they were called Gunner and Striker and Sand Dune. <laughs> I was intimidated out of my mind, but let's, uh, let's, let's be honest, I had never tried to serve my country before, and I, I felt like they asked I should, I should try to contribute. So I said yes, and I showed up, and I thought what I gotta do is convince these people that I know what I'm talking about. So I opened by describing all my credentials and talking about my expertise and all the research I'd done, and, and then I taught this four-hour class, and the feedback afterward was brutal. Uh, I read the feedback forums, and one comment said, uh, there was more knowledge in the audience than on the podium. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> Another had written, I gained nothing from this session, but I trust the instructor got useful insight. <laughs> <laughs> now, you all are amused by this? This was not fun for me. <laughs> like, my, my, uh, my, my first thought was like, like, I wonder if humans can hibernate like bears. Like, how many months can I, can I go to sleep for until this doesn't hurt anymore? And I had a problem, which is I had committed to teach another session. And I didn't have time to reboot my material. I'd crammed everything I knew into four hours. I also didn't have um, much time uh, to, to make any real changes. So all I could do was I could take my critics and try to turn them into my coaches. And I wasn't sure how to do that. I had these people who were just trashing my, not only my knowledge, but also the way I delivered the knowledge. And I thought, all right, <laughs> their feedback was not helpful. Instead, let me ask them for advice. So I went to a few of the participants and I said, can you give me one suggestion for what I could do better next time? And I got a lot of useless tips, like, why don't you go run a bunch of organizations and you know, lose all your hair, check, now. But, <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, be experienced and seasoned before you try to tell us how to lead. I'm like, I can't do anything with that. I don't have a time machine. Um, but I also got a really useful tip, which was uh, one person said, well, you know, we, we can tell that you're half our age. Why don't you call out the elephant in the room? I thought, okay, that's something I can, I can control and I can change my intro. So Tim, I, uh, I showed up the next week. I looked out at the audience and I thought, I have nothing to lose. It could not go worse than it did. I, I picked one guy in particular, I looked at Sand Dune, and I said, <laughs> I said, I know what you're thinking right now. I know exactly what's on your mind. What could I possibly learn from a professor who's 12 years old? <laughs> Sand Dune was not at all entertained by that question. Uh, but another, another participant jumped in and said, oh, that's ridiculous. You gotta be at least 13. <laughs> and that broke the ice, and the whole room burst out laughing. I taught the same material I had before, but the feedback was completely different afterward. I got comments like, although junior in experience, he dealt with the evidence in an interesting way. And the professors seem to get younger every year. <laughs> or is it just me getting older? And I like learning about how to motivate millennials from someone who almost is one. <laughs> and it was a great lesson for me to take myself off a pedestal uh, and you know, try to show a little bit of vulnerability. But I think to now answer your question, I think the mistake that we had made before is when we gave out the feedback forms, when you ask people for feedback, they tell you what you did wrong or right yesterday, which means you have a bunch of critics and you have cheerleaders, and neither of those groups is helping you grow. Um, they might actually demotivate you if they're critics, um, and if they're cheerleaders, they might make you complacent. What I wanted were coaches, people who saw my hidden potential and were willing to help me develop it. And it turns out, the research shows that when you ask people for advice rather than feedback, they give you more constructive tips. Instead of looking backward, they look forward and they say, well, here's a specific thing that I think you could adjust. And so I actually think we should stop having feedback conversations and start having advice conversations. Yeah, uh, I think that's absolutely right. I've, I've got do my, you? I do, I do. Although if I could give you some advice. No, I, <laughs> I, I've become very interested in this, in this question of feedback and, and how difficult it is to get useful feedback. And I think framing it as advice uh, works for me. And very often, I, find, I give a lot of talks, for example, and you come off stage and the instinct is, you say, well, you know, how was it? Like, how did I do? And what you really want to be told is, you did great. 
And actually, that's what happens, because you step off stage, people, because it's hard, people know it's hard, Everyone's gonna, people pat you on the back, and go, you did a great job, you did a great job. Very, very unusual for someone to say, um, maybe next time you could do the following thing, and it would be better. And they don't say that because you didn't ask, actually. But possibly because you didn't really want to hear. But the, the best um, feedback I've ever got I've, I've, is from people who volunteered that. So I once gave a, a speech, and one of the senior folk in uh, the TED organization was in the audience. And I came off stage, and a whole bunch of people saying, great job, great job. And I, he, I could see him lingering. I thought, I want to hear what he was going to say. And he, he came up, and he said, you, um, you talked about this, uh, this British fighter plane, the Spitfire, but a lot of the audience are international, and they wouldn't necessarily know what a Spitfire is. So next time, I think you should include a photograph of a Spitfire. And it was like, it's great. It's specific. Here's exactly what you need to do. Here's why you need to do it. And, like, and this is why TED is such a brilliant organization for coaching speakers and presenting speakers. So, but you, you have this. So you're going to say something. Well, no, I, I think what's interesting here is, and some of you have lived this, the, the more senior you get, the more success you achieve, the harder it is to get people to tell you the truth. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've worked with some leaders where I, I kind of imagine that they come into work in the morning and they say good morning, and a bunch of people are like, great point. <laughs> um, maybe some of you work for those leaders. I hope none of you are those leaders. But uh, what it, one of the things I've learned is, uh, I, so after every talk I give, every event I do, I, as soon as I get backstage, I ask, what's the one thing I can do better? Yeah. That's my advice question. And sometimes people don't have notes, and I'm so disappointed. Yeah, often they don't have notes, actually. And sometimes they people were... People do not expect to be asked the question. No, they don't. Apparently yeah. it's rare, but sometimes I think uh, they were just absorbed or engaged, and you know, they weren't really thinking critically about it. But other times they're afraid. They don't want to hurt your, your ego. They don't want to damage the relationship. Yeah. And I ended up studying this a few years ago, and I, I found with um, Constantinos Coutiferis uh, in a series of studies that criticizing your, yourself out loud can help. Yeah. So when, when, when I get kind of deer in headlights reactions, I have to say, well, here are the three things that I think I did poorly. Um, I rambled way too long on this current answer. I'm doing it right now. Um, I, uh, I feel like I, didn't, uh, I missed an opportunity to tailor uh, one of the points to your industry or to the culture I'm in right now. Um, what do you think about those things? And then what else did you see? And it, it's so interesting to watch people's reactions when I do that because I'm not just claiming that I want feedback or information or advice. I'm demonstrating to them live that I can take it yeah. and that I'm not here to, you know, to prove that I'm a great speaker. I'm here to improve my ability as a speaker. And uh, I think some, I, I've gotten this question a few times when I talk about this research. People are like, wait, but isn't it scary to admit the things you screwed up? Guess what? The people who interact with you, they already know what you're bad at. <laughs> You can't hide it from, from them. You can't. So you might as well get credit for having the self-awareness to see it and then the humility and integrity to admit it out loud. Yeah. I think. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give shorter comments now. Where did you want to go with this? You don't have to. Well, OK. Just to, do, do you think we need to more questions and shorter answers? Or are we, is it fine as we are? OK, there's the feedback. It's fine. Don't agree with him just because. Tim lives here, and I don't. So this is like a home, a home field give, advantage. Okay, you, can give you, a, you can give me a shorter answer to this one because on the same subject, you specifically say you ask people to give you a, a score out of ten, which oh. I found counterintuitive, but it made sense when you explained it. So why do you do that? I, I learned this as a springboard diver. Every time I hit the water, my coach would give me a zero to ten score, and it was the only thing that helped me calibrate: do I need to make a major change or a minor change? So um, actually, before I ask what can I do better, I ask people for the zero to 10 score. And if somebody says eight, I know they really meant a six and they were being nice. Um, but you know, I'm gonna make some, some significant adjustments. If somebody says four, I need, to, I need to go back to the drawing board. And so it's a way to, for me to gauge how, how big is the comment you're about to give me. Yeah, what happens if someone says 10? Which I imagine does happen. It, it does happen, and I tell them I don't accept tens, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and and then uh, they're, they're like, "Well, okay, nine and a half." I'm like, "Great. Well, what would have made it a 10? You're like, <laughs> "Now that would be annoying." But okay, um, you specifically say, "What would have made it a 10? You accepting my first answer? I, but that's, I'm willing to be annoying in service <laughs> of being better. In service of personal growth. That's fair enough. So, okay, personal growth. So, just asking for a friend. <laughs> So let's, <laughs> let's say that uh, there was like a 50-year-old economist, grew up in Chesterfield, 
and he, uh, he had gotten interested in calisthenics. So we kind of like, uh, you know, those Fun, you know, those funny sort of gym rings and kind of like doing stuff on that and so on. Um, but he wasn't very good at it, mainly because he's a 50-year-old economist. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of, it's hard work, actually, trying to get better. Um, give me, give him, <laughs> this friend of mine, some, some advice based on, based on your research, based on the ideas in your book, how, how to learn more effectively at this difficult discipline. Okay, so I have two questions first. Number one, why? Like, what, why are you doing calisthenics and trying to get better at it? Yeah, it's, uh, I want to get fitter, stronger. I mean, my friend wants to get fitter, stronger, maybe look slightly better on the beach. Uh, also, it's, it's fun. Your body is moving in unusual ways that you've never, you're trying to do things you've never done before. That's interesting. <laughs> okay. Um, it, oh, nothing grow you up. There was nothing rude about that. <laughs> No, nothing Honestly. you just described sounds fun at all, but... Yeah. Uh, okay, and then says the, the Says the springboard diver. That's, that's different. You get to feel like a bird for half a second. Okay. And then a dolphin. It's yeah. fun. Okay. Um, it's the transition from the bird to the dolphin that worries me, but fine. Okay? <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, okay, the other question is, um, where, where are you stagnating? What are you not... Like, what's the specific thing you want to get better at? Yeah, okay. So I'm, I need to go and ask my coach about that. Um, uh, what the, it just feels hard. It's just hard. You go and, you know, you, I'm, uh, my coach is currently in Morocco for, you know, reasons. So I'm going to the gym by myself with a spreadsheet, do these exercises by myself. And it's very easy to just kind of cheat, slack a bit. I'm a bit busy. Oh, my back hurts a bit. Maybe I won't do the, the abs work. Um, so there's that kind of, there's that barrier to pushing as hard as you should to get the maximum benefit. Got it. Okay. So... I. I mean, thinking out loud here, I, I would do... Bear with us, sorry. No, I mean, I, I would do a couple of things. The first one, I, I, the place I'd want to start is to say, why are you so opposed to the feeling of it being hard? Yeah. If it feels easy, then you're not challenging yourself. Yeah. It's supposed to be hard, I think. Um, secondly, I think this seems like an opportunity for deliberate play yeah. uh, as opposed to deliberate practice. Uh, you claimed it was fun, but then you're talking about pushing yourself through a slog yeah. uh, that's, that's sort of painful. And so, uh, well, I'll give you my version of this. So... Um, I, uh, I, I run on a treadmill, and the first thing I did to try to make it fun was uh, I, I, I told my wife to delete shows from the DVR uh, if, um, if I didn't meet my workout goals. This is fun. <laughs> no, but um, if I did meet them, then they would stay there, and I could watch them while I run. Okay. And so that was motivating. So like, I really want to know what happened in um, Harlan Coben's new Netflix series, and uh, some of you are probably watching right now. Um, Fool Me Once? Is that what it's called? Is anyone watching it? Yeah, loved it. Anyway, um, so that's a reward that's sitting there that I paired with the activity that makes it fun for me. Um, number two, I have specific goals um, that I'm competing against myself for. Yep. And so like, personal bests are really hard. What I can do, though, is I can improve upon yesterday. And so what I do is I, I chart my progress week by week. And I'm like, OK, this is a motivating challenge now to see if I can be better than I was last week. So have you tried all of this already? No, this is all good. This is all good. Because I feel that I'm just like, I'm just kind of white knuckling it and going, yeah, I just, yes, it should be hard. So it's going to be hard, but, but it can be fun as well. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. We'll find out. The, uh, and you had this idea of, um, so there's, there's this great chapter about deliberate play. You talk about Steph Curry's uh, training regime. Um, there's also this idea of interleaving, which I found interesting. Oh, yeah. So this, this was counterintuitive to me. If you look at learning research, um, I always thought that you should practice the same skill over and over again in order to get better at it because you do one rep and you figure out what your mistake was and then you make the adjustment and then you want to see if you've been able to correct it and then you keep refining that way. Psychologists don't find that. Um, they find that alternating between different skills actually leads to deeper learning and faster growth. So for example, let's say you're trying to improve your basketball shot and you want to become a better painter. The advice is to alternate between those two things. Um, go out, take you know, five shots, and then do a painting, and then come back. Um, and the reason, I, I think there are actually a few mechanism, mechanisms behind it, but the one that I've found most compelling is that when you put it away for a little while, then um, you're actually um, you're ingraining it more yeah. when you have to then re-rehearse it, as opposed to you can go to autopilot too quickly if you do them back to back to back to back. And do we, do we have the data on kind of what that period should be? I mean, you said five shots and then go paint. I mean, is that it? Or is it like do, basketball for a day and then painting for a day? Do we, or do we not? 
this is the kind of precision that economists always want in human behavior. <laughs> and psychologists cannot provide. Yeah. Uh, I think, no, I mean, it, a lot of what I would guess just comes from here's a particular experiment that happened to work with a 10 minute interval on this and then a 10 minute interval on that. I think the best guideline from the researchers who study this is when you start to get bored or when you start to stagnate, it's time to switch. Yeah, yeah. So uh, on the subject of what psychologists can teach us and stepping away from the book for a moment because uh, we don't want to cover everything in the book because you all want to buy the book, right? Because it's fantastic. Um, can we talk about the, the state of uh, organizational psychology and uh, sometimes called the replication crisis, uh, various scandals, which we won't go into, uh, it's all just a bit too painful, um, but just this general feeling. So Daniel Kahneman, I think, the, the great Nobel Prize winning uh, psychologist, put it quite well recently. He said, 10 years ago when I read a, a surprising finding, that was backed by the data, seemed to be backed by the data, I'd believe it. And now when I read a surprising finding that seems to be backed by the data, my instinct is not to believe it. Um, because there have been so many, there have been some alleg credible alleg allegations of out-and-out -out fraud, but also just a lot of pretty sloppy research, a lot of stuff that turned out not to stand up. So what is your feeling about this field that you, you know, you're in the middle of now? So my job is not to have feelings about the field, it's to follow the evidence. And I think there are a couple of things that I've learned from the evidence. The first one is, uh, look, science evolves and our methods should get rigorous over time. So you know, a bunch of my early, early studies were done with smaller samples than I would use today. Um, and part of that was a problem of access and part of that was um, some flawed assumptions about statistical power that hadn't been um, you know, sort of made as transparent um, and clear as they are now. Um, and so I think this is science progressing, is the first thing I would say. Second thing I would say is, um, I think that psychologists have taken the brunt of this when all kinds of fields are struggling with replication. Um, there's a team led by Brian Nozick that uh, famously, they tried to replicate over 200 papers in psychology and they found about half of the findings replicated. Well, we have to ask a question about what is the ideal replication rate? I don't expect every finding to replicate. Sometimes you have different people in your studies. Sometimes um, changes over time or across cultures or contexts really matter. Um, and sometimes uh, you, know, you, you, just, you happen to get support for something that's relatively rare and the outlier effect um, was there and then you run a larger version of the study and it wasn't. And we don't want a 100% replication rate um, because then we're not learning, we're not testing surprising ideas ever. Yeah. Uh, we're just confirming our intuition. Um, so Brian's team recently, uh, they did replications in cancer biology research and found failed replications over 40%. And so even the hard sciences have this problem and there are all kinds of reasons why you know, human bodies would respond differently to different drugs at different times. Um, so I think we need, to, we need to temper our expectations of science. We want science to get better, um, but I think what we wanna know is that probabilistically, when you do a series of studies, um, that's more likely to approximate the truth than whatever your intuition is. Yeah. And I guess the other thing I would say about this is I had a, a debate with Danny Kahneman about this. Um, we did a Rethinking podcast a couple of years ago, and I was troubled by his statement that he doesn't believe a counterintuitive finding. Danny introduced us in part to confirmation bias, yeah. right? The problem that we all like to support the hypotheses we believe and reject the ones that don't match our assumptions and motivations. And so if you're gonna then knee-jerk reject a hypothesis because it doesn't sound true to you, you're being a bad scientist. And you, know, you don't wanna have that debate with a Nobel laureate because you're not gonna win. <laughs> and Danny convinced me that my thinking about this was incomplete and that there's a difference between what I've now come to think of as um, extremely counterintuitive findings and non-intuitive findings. Um, I think there are a lot of cute findings in psychology where there's like a tiny thing you do and then it changes your life. Like, we should be skeptical about that. That is counterintuitive. It's the opposite of what is likely to be true. Non-intuitive is what, much more of what we were talking about earlier. I read the study, I never would have thought of that. And then as we unpack the mechanisms and look at the data, that makes sense to me now. And I think that, that's something we should still aspire to do.